This exclusive forecast is provided by WLKY Weather. Whenever you need the forecast, just ask, what's Jay say? Hi, everybody. I'm WLKY Chief Meteorologist Jay Cardosi with a look at the upcoming weekend weather because we have some nice events going on around Kentucky. And if by chance you're going to be heading out to one of those events, make sure you grab the umbrellas, unfortunately. It looks like there's going to be a chance for a couple of rain showers this coming weekend. All right, the first event that we're talking about is in uh, Oldham County, Oldham County Day. This is at the uh, Courthouse Square in LaGrange. Uh, this coming Saturday, 9 o'clock in the morning to 4 in the afternoon. Matter of fact, the parade starts at 10 o'clock in the morning. There's going to be live entertainment, food, vendors, giveaways, arts, crafts, exhibits. So a great event there. Also, in Lawrenceburg, Indiana, we have the Whiskey City Twilight Challenge going on. Uh, this goes from noon until 10 o'clock in the evening. Even cycling races going on that start at 1 o'clock in the afternoon with food trucks and live music. As I've mentioned, uh, dress for the weather, a chance for a few showers, not a complete washout, but we'll be dodging those showers around 68 in the morning, low 80s in the afternoon. Hey, Jay, tell us what do you say? Hey, Jay, what do we say? We can count on you. After two decades, we can say a lot about Jay Cardosi. We can say he has your most accurate forecast and is the Ohio Valley weather expert. But it's not about what we say. What matters is what's Jay say. What's Jay say about your weekend plans, your Little League game? His answer is still the one more people trust. Want to know the forecast? Just ask. What's Jay say? say? Remarkable yield in a season none too favorable for corn. Let Mr. Ayler tell you in his own words. I live in Jefferson County, Indiana, just below Manville, a little town about 10 miles southeast of Madison. Seven years ago, I came from Carroll County, Kentucky, and bought my farm consisting of 135 acres, part of which is ridgeland. There are about 55 acres of bottom land, 30 of which overflow nearly every year. The Indian Kentucky River runs right through my farm, and as I say, it's up over part of my land. One thing though, I want to make clear is that my five acre plot is not overflow land. A lot of people think that we growers in Jefferson County win high records because we have overflow ground. But this prize winning plot has been covered with water only once, and that was in 1913, the year of the big flood. So much for my ground. Now I'll tell you how I handled it. Last year, 1926, this 15 acre field was in tobacco and was broken from clover. At that time, I hauled out 20 loads of manure to the acre and put on 400 pounds of high-grade fertilizer. The tobacco was big and tall, but in August, a windstorm blew it down so badly that I cut only 700 sticks and plowed the rest down. Of course, I think this had a tendency to help my corn this year, as tobacco is rich in certain plant foods. I rebroke the field in April of 27, plowing it six inches deep with a riding plow, then disked it three times with a harrow, rolled it twice, and pulled a heavy drag over it to mash the clods, and then ran over it with a 60-tooth harrow. 
After I was satisfied with the condition of the seed bed, I broadcast 250 pounds of Red Star per acre using a wheat drill. The planting date was June 7th. The seed I used is a yellow dent, big ears and deep kernels. There is no real name for it, but it is a variety that I've been planting and selecting for several years. My rows were 34 inches apart, and the corn was dropped 8 inches in the row. I really had my drill set for 12 inch planting, but it got 8 inches. I believe generally that this is too thick, but my ground was naturally productive and could stand closer planting. Then, too, we had plenty of rain to furnish moisture. According to M. O. Pimps of the Department of Agricultural Extension of Purdue University, climatic conditions during the year 1927 were among the most unfavorable experienced by Indiana corn growers. Excessive rainfall during the spring and early summer followed by low temperatures during the late summer resulted in late planting, poor stands, and late maturing corn, which was generally of poor quality. End of quote. You should always remember that a corn crop usually pays and pays well in good as well as poor seasons. To plan ahead for the corn crop and use those methods and practices which have been tested out and found trustworthy. Everybody, we're here with Coffee Talk and we have a new guest today. We have Dave Taylor who's coming to talk to us about our his new book. I'm so excited. Tell us about your book and first of all, what's the title of it? The title of it is Ripples Over the Dyke and it is a series of stories of, that are obscure about local history. Twelve chapters that uh, tell different tales that most folks probably have not ever heard before. And we know that most books don't take one week to write. So how long have you been working on this book? What have you, collecting and researching? and I have actually been researching and working on this for about 11 years. I got interrupted by two other books along the way. But uh, initially I started out writing Ripples Over the Dyke and came across one story that was obscure about a murder that happened here in Jefferson County, Indiana in 1877. And the more I researched on that, the more it became a book of its own. Uh, got too much material for just one right. chapter. So uh, that interrupted the flow of uh, Ripples Over the Dyke. So uh, Ripples Over the Dyke became its own entity later on. And uh, just now that I'm retired from newspaper work, I had time to finish it. That's awesome. So what are your future plans for Ripples in the Dyke? Where are we going to see you in the next, in the future? Okay, well, I do have a uh, book signing coming up at the Port William Historical Society. That's the Historical Society in Carroll County. And that will be on Tuesday, July the 24th, 6.30 p.m. And that's at the Masterson House. That's just on the east side of Carrollton. And uh, I'd love to see a lot of folks come out there that night. So you'll be doing book signings there, and your book will be for sale at that? That's correct, and I'll be doing a presentation okay. about the book, some of the, the information that I'm going to hopefully share with you today. That's awesome. Uh, also, the book is available every time that uh, the Infinite Realm does an appearance anywhere, any concerts. I always have my books there as long as, or as well as the uh, CDs that the, the Realm has recorded. Now, I love Infinite Realm, but could you tell us just a little bit about that, and then we'll go back into your book. 
The Infinite Realm began in 1969. We were all high school uh, students at that time at Trimble County High School. And uh, we began singing just on a lark on band trips and decided, well, you know, we, it's this kind of fun. Let's, let's start a group. So Nancy Pettit, she was at that time, later married Scott Burroughs. Myself, Steve Brown, and Tony Gossam, along with Bob Consley, were the original members of that group, and we still continue today, a little bit different in the, in the uh, personnel. Steve, Tony, and I are the original members that are still there, and all but one of our members are Trimble County High School graduates. We have recently added a guitarist, David Sherman, from Carroll County, who is uh, now working with us. So uh, he's the odd man out. He's not a Trimble graduate. And you have a brand new recording out. Well, it's maybe two, maybe a year old. A year old, A yeah. year old. But and it, it is my favorite, so I want him to tell you about that. And then we'll go back to the book. It is still new to us. Uh, oh, it's, it's beautiful. Message of Love is the title of that album. We recorded that in Hendersonville, Tennessee, with a good friend of mine, Ron Fairchild, who is the keyboard player for the Oak Ridge Boys. Oh, that's and amazing. has been uh, the keyboard player for them for the better part of 35 years. And has uh, done a lot of recording over the years. He records Restless Heart. Some of the Oak Ridge Boys recordings are done at his studio. And uh, so we recorded that a year ago, and it has uh, some songs that we've written and a number of songs that are, are gospel music classics. So uh, hopefully folks will check that out. It is fabulous. So make sure you check the CD out and talk to them about that on Infinite Realm. So we're going to go back to the book, and this is Ripples Over the Dyke. And I'll show you a little picture of this. We have some tabs we would like for you to tell us a little bit about since you have some photographs so we're going to hand this to you okay before we go any further though i want to just get an idea of what are we what are we going to expect in this book what is exciting and why would i want to come and purchase your ripples over the dike well a number of folks have no idea of the history that is here in Madison and Trimble and Carroll counties and basically those are the areas that i have lived in and worked almost all of my life, so that's why I'm interested in writing about the obscure events of this area. Uh, we had a dike here at one time that uh, helped in navigation along the Ohio River, and uh, we had uh, a number of special visitors to this area over the years. Bobby Kennedy uh, came in 1968 for a presidential campaign. Uh, Winfield Scott was also here on a presidential campaign back in 1852. A uh, number of famous entertainers have been in this area. Marty Robbins, I was blessed with the opportunity to spend some time with him backstage during his concert appearance here in 1980. Uh, a murder that happened in Carroll County in 1877, very few people know about it because it happened in 1877, 140 years ago. And uh, so it's very obscure, but it's very interesting in that the sheriff was charged with that murder. Do you think he did it? You have to buy the book to find out. Oh, that's even more fabulous. I'm excited. And I've read all of your books, Dave, so you know that. I have not read this one yet because it just came out. When was it released? It was released in uh, June. June. Just a few weeks ago, in fact. 2018. Mm -hmm. I just want you to know that I think you're a wonderful author. So well, tell us you. a little bit about this. First, I would like to go back, though. I would like to find out, how did you come up with this name? Years ago, when I was a little boy, my dad used to point out the ripples over the dike from the bridge. Aww. The dike is still actually there. It's submerged underwater. Uh, at pool stage, it's 12 feet down on the uh, Corps of Engineers maps, navigation maps. And uh, so my dad used to point out, you can see the ripples over that dike uh, from the bridge. And yeah, and from Telegraph Hill in the wintertime when the leaves are off the trees, you can see the arc coming out from the Milton shore into the channel of the river. And uh, so that's where the title came from. And basically, uh, the ripples can be also uh, related to that they are things, there are things that are submerged in our local history that uh, this is being brought to light as ripples of things that have happened in the past here in our area. That is magnificent and so interesting in how we can go back. And you have quite a few photographs in here and stories as well. Absolutely. 
the book actually begins with an introductory chapter that gives a uh, history of this area, a history of how Madison came to be, of how Milton came to be, and uh, Carrollton came to be. It was Port William originally. And some of the industries that uh, were strong back in the old days that uh, helped these communities survive, and of course the steamboats along the river, uh, and the railroad here in Madison, and then later on the railroad that uh, came to Carroll County provided a lot of opportunity for industry and, and travel. Tell me about the most interesting story in your st book this time. Probably the most obscure story that is in Ripples Over the Dyke is a story about how the community here in Madison got rid of the rat population back around the turn of the century or in from the 19th into the 20th century. Years ago, uh, I worked at the Madison Courier, and we had frequent visits from Judge Hen uh, Harry Nichols. Judge Harry Nichols lived to be just a little past 100 years of age and uh, practiced law right up until the time that he died. And uh, he came in to tell the story one time about when he was a boy that uh, there, were, there was a dump in Madison in basically the area of where Springdale Cemetery is at the foot of Presbyterian Street and uh, there was a pro proliferation of rats in that area and uh, it was dangerous actually a number of folks were afraid of rat attacks afraid of rabies for their children so uh, in the local taverns and this is what Judge Nichols told me because he was one of the boys at that time that was paid to catch the rats okay in the taverns, some of the local businessmen decided we're going to make a sport out of this. And uh, they said, we're going to pay some kids to catch rats. They have to be alive. You can't kill them. Catch rats and bring them in. And when we get X amount of rats, we're going to stage a rat fight. So they built a, uh, an arena in the area north of, of Walnut Street, where the Conservation Club is now. And they built an arena there, a sunken pit, and uh, they would put six rats at a time in that pit and then turn a rat terrier dog loose on it. And then they would time the dog as to how long it took to kill six rats. And all the guys around the arena then would bet on it. And uh, so sometimes, you know, you're eradicating the rats from the city, but some folks are putting some extra bucks in their pocket as well. <laughs> But I thought that was quite interesting uh, when Judge Nichols told me about that. He lived it, and I thought, you know, folks today don't know about such things. And uh, it was something I wanted to relate in the book. Then that was from Judge Nichols. Correct. And where did he live? He, he lived in Madison? He lived in Madison. Okay. He was the postmaster for many years and then was elected circuit judge here in Jefferson County and served for several years. If you see the movie Our Town, which was filmed during World War II, uh, Judge Nichols is actually, he appears in that movie. Uh, it was a movie made by the War Department to show all of our servicemen and women around the world, this is what you're fighting for. This is the typical American town. And uh, Judge Nichols is seated at his, uh, at his bench at that time in the movie. That is wonderful. What about another story that you'd like to share with us? Well, we talked about the dike. Let me just yes. briefly say why the dike existed. In the early days, in the 1800s, many times during the year, the river would get so low that boats could not navigate. And even when they could navigate, at Madison, our levee was so uh, slanted, so shallow, that many of the boats couldn't pull all the way in. So they would have to moor out in the river and send a uh, smaller boat back and forth to deliver passengers and cargo to and from the port. So the Corps of Engineers decided in 1888 that uh, we needed a dike here. There were dikes, probably a total of more than 100 that were built up and down the Ohio River over the years. And what they were to do was to channel the water more toward the Madison shore to make it a deeper uh, port for the steamboats to be able to pull into port, deliver oh. their cargo and their passengers. And it was actually uh, half a mile long. It arced out from the Milton shore about 100 feet downriver from where the bridge sits today. And uh, the end of it was in the middle of today's channel of the river, 
uh, about halfway between Walnut and uh, Jefferson Streets in on the Madison side. It left a channel of about 900 feet or so for the boats to be able to navigate. So the boats would come up and then people could they could come up to that and people could load the boats from there? Or Not they on would... the dike. Okay. No, the dike okay. actually was to push the current of the water okay. more toward Madison and deepen the water flow. So that the uh, boats could become more correct. accessible. Now, at, at times, the dike was submerged underwater, so they would have to put buoys out there to uh, direct traffic around that. And unfortunately, it's not in my book, but it will be in a follow-up book, that uh, there was a City of Madison steamboat that was built right here in Madison. And uh, in 1894, two years after the dike was finished, one night in the middle of the night, the river had covered the dike and the buoys had floated out of place. And so the, uh, the, oars, the man who was steering the boat at the time, his name was Wheeler Collier, he uh, was watching the buoys and all of a sudden <coughs> the boat raked about a 70 foot gash in the bottom of the boat and landed on the end of the dike and sunk. Um, yeah. So it could be a very dangerous thing at times during the year as well. And I shouldn't probably ask this, but I'm going to ask. So is the story of the lady that actually was killed on the steamboat, you told me about this when you were writing, and it was a, a, a steamboat story. Is that in this book or is that coming up? That's in the follow-up. In the follow-up. That is a story about... I knew I wasn't supposed to bring it up yet. <laughs> that is a story about the uh, Redstone which happened in the 1850s. A couple got married here in Madison and then boarded the Redstone and uh, the boat headed up river to Carrollton and uh, pulled into shore to take on another passenger and exploded. And uh, so that will be in a follow-up book called Crippled on the Dyke. Oh, I cannot wait. That is a fabulous story. I'm not going to even tell you what he's told me. He's only told me little bits and pieces. So, well, let's talk about Ripple over the Dyke. Okay. Uh, I'm always going a little bit further ahead, we, right? We've had uh, a number of, of guests in this area right. who have come. Um, some have been presidents. Zachary Taylor visited here on his way from Louisville when he was headed to the White House after being elected. Uh, William Henry Harrison and Benjamin Harrison, both from Indiana, have visited Madison in the past. And in 1852, the Whig candidate for the presidency. His name was General Winfield Scott. He served longer than any other military general in the United States Army service. He served under seven different presidents, starting with President James Madison and ending with Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War. In 1852, he was the Whig candidate for president and was making a tour upriver on the steamboat and stopped in Madison and uh, visited up on the hilltop a uh, area that the local people thought would be a great place for a military hospital. And although it didn't become a military hospital, eventually those grounds, which was the Godman Farm, became Madison State Hospital. And uh, he thought that at that time that would be a great place for a military hospital because of the great view up and down the river. And it was a it defensible a point. Uh, then he also, after uh, leaving Madison, the boat steamed up river and it was going to go take an overnight excursion to Cincinnati where he was going to make another appearance. But a fog settled in and because of navigation uh, problems at that time in 1852 on the Ohio River, the, the steamboat captain was afraid to negotiate the river in the fog and pulled into Carrollton. And there were about a thousand people waiting at Carrollton. Uh, they were waiting with bonfires and everything set to cheer at him when he went by. Well, so happens the boat slips into port and the people are ecstatic. You know, the, the presidential candidate, this famous general, has landed in Carrollton. And uh, so they called for him to come out. He'd already gone to bed, okay? So awakened by all of these shouts and screams for him to come out and uh, give a speech, he did come out on deck in a dressing gown. <laughs> General Scott was about six feet five and a rotund. Uh, imagine, if you will, Sergeant Schultz on Hogan's Heroes coming out in a women's dressing gown. Uh, that might have been similar to what he would have looked at, looked like. You can't imagine Donald Trump or Hillary or any of the today's candidates coming out in a dressing gown looking like that. It would. 
it would uh, the TV people would have a thrill with that. Right. <laughs> it would probably make history it just would. like this did. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. That is funny. Tell us where we can purchase your book. The book is available in Carrollton at uh, Artful Gifts. That's Dinah Marshall's uh, store there in downtown on Main Street, just around from the courthouse. In uh, Madison, it is available at the Village Lights bookstore across from the Ohio Theater. It's available at the Visitor Center down by the Lanier Home and also available at the uh, Jefferson County Historical Society Museum. Or you can purchase it online at Amazon.com. It's also available in a Kindle version on uh, Amazon as well. That's magnificent. Dave, is there anything else you would like to tell us about your book and your new adventures? The uh, the two stories really come to mind. One is that when I was in the seventh grade uh, at Trimble County Junior High School, that year we had uh, a special guest to come in for Veterans Day to speak, and it was none other than our own school superintendent at the time, uh, Carney Agnew Hallowell. Most people knew him as C.A. Hallowell or Professor Hallowell. He uh, came in and spoke to us about his experiences during World War I. He had been a student at University of Kentucky, played football for the Kentucky Wildcats, and uh, when America entered the war in 1917, he uh, went to his recruiting station and joined the Navy. Uh, he was placed aboard a troop transport ship. These ships would transport thousands of American soldiers uh, to the front in uh, France, and then they would return home with wounded and uh, on, we're talking about an event that happened 100 years ago on May 31st, 1918. They were making a return trip from France back to the United States and when they were sunk by a German U-boat. Uh, Mr. Hollowell was a fireman, which basically he fed the boilers with coal down in the hold of the ship, several decks down. And uh, his experience speaks out of the pages of this book. I had an opportunity to sit down with him uh, years later when I was at the Madison Courier and uh, to talk with him about his experience. So uh, his words speak out of this book as to his experience in the sinking of that ship, what he felt. And, uh, you know, I can only imagine what it would feel like to be aboard a ship that uh, you know is going down. Right. And you have only uh, scant minutes to get up on top deck and, and to get yourself away from the danger. The other story that I would uh, want to share is that in 1877 there was a murder of a teenage girl in Carroll County. And uh, there was a family there that uh, had been causing trouble. So a number of folks decided we're going to run this family out of our community. And uh, so six men went out one night to uh, try to scare this family out of the county, set fire on their home. And uh, when the family woke up, their house was on fire. They sent the young girl to the front door because there was a bucket just outside the front door to get water to help put out the fire. As soon as she opened the door, a volley of shots came from across the road. She was struck several times and uh, died the next day. Well, a few weeks went by, no arrests were made, and appeared there was no uh, investigation being made. And so a constable from Gent stepped up. He had heard some rumors, and he decided, hmm, I think I'll pursue these rumors. He called a friend of his who was a detective in Louisville to come up and assist in the investigation. And as it turned out, the incumbent sheriff, one of his deputies, and his immediate predecessor sheriff, were all charged with the murder of that young girl. You have to buy the book to find out how it all turns out. That is interesting. Why do you love history so much? It was inspired by my dad, I guess. My was dad it? used to tell a lot of historical stories. Dad lived to be a hundred, and when he was a boy, there were a lot of Civil War soldiers still living. In fact, he told stories of when he was in school at, at the old Locust School, that there was an old Civil War veteran that would come down when in the wintertime the creek would freeze over and the old veteran would come down and skate with the kids. And uh, so he, he grew up with a lot of history. Dad went from the age of, of uh, plowing behind a horse to the age of the, the, we're landing people on the moon. So he saw a lot 
and uh, shared a lot with me, and that, that became uh, inbred in me from the beginning. I love history, and especially I, you, the obscure stories. You, you have know. definitely sparked an interest in myself. I know there was one book that I have not actually told you I'd read all of them, but you have one about musicians. It's a very large book, yes. right? And you have that. So I haven't read that one, but the rest of them so far have been magnificent. And I'm looking Thank forward you. to reading this. I always love to hear about our history around here. And I really wasn't interested until you sparked it <laughs> several years back. So oh, we're excited to have you. Make sure you. that you look out for Ripples Over the Dyke. He has beautiful photography. Uh, photos sorry his beautiful photos you've actually have some drawings in there mm -hmm. and how many stories do you think total do you know how many there are 12 chapters, 12 chapters. and uh, then the introduction kind of gives a brief history of uh, this area from like Markland Dam down to the uh, border of Trimble and Oldham counties so it tells about the formation of the counties it tells quite a bit about that, right. yes, of how Trimble County was carved off of Gallatin County, and then Carroll County was carved off of Trimble County. Trimble County also was carved off of Oldham County, and uh, I think Oldham would like to still claim Trimble County today. The Historical Society over there has a uh, interesting uh, thing at, at Bedford, just outside of uh, Bedford on Fairgrounds Road, of where they are preserving an old plantation that uh, was a slave house and it was actually the the home of the first sheriff in Trimble County and uh, so that is that's fantastic I'm looking forward to reading these stories I hope that you will come and find Dave to uh, the 24th in Carrollton at the Masterson house uh, at 630 correct that's correct the July infinite 24th. realm will also be singing at the uh, new uh, Christian Church in Carrollton it's actually the uh, uh, English campus. It's the Carrollton campus of the English Christian Church. They have taken over a, uh, a new building out when on the south that? end of 227, and that's on Saturday night, the 21st of July. And, we'll and be the there books will be available the as books well. Will be available there. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dave. You've been wonderful to interview, and of course, you're my wonderful friend. So, thank you, <laughs> thank you for coming, and we hope that you'll look up Ripples Over the Dyke.